So it's a session to get us all to share um, in what we call uncertain times, survival. Um, I, wanted, I did a CPD session a few months ago for the MIA, which was about managing the caseload in the ENS and RSMS, especially when there was up to 50% refusal. The, um, I wanted to call that session Fear and Loathing and Permanent Skilled Entry. They wouldn't let me, but it's kind of how you feel. Um, we're all feeling pain. Uh, it is a challenging environment to work in. Uh, it's challenging, especially if you're a sole practitioner where you really are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis to understand, is it just you or is it, you know, are, do other people have this problem as well? So that's kind of where we want to take the tone of today's session, to, to talk through some of the issues that we've identified as probably some main talking points, but develop and we'll take questions and also encourage others in the room to also respond to some of the discussion, not just have it coming back to the panel. We've got a fantastic panel here who can lead the discussion. Um, we're not in, this is not new territory, uh, immigration, is the same as death and tax. They will keep, they, it's a fact of life, they'll change it, okay? And they're gonna keep changing it. It's a cycle. Um, for those of us who've been around for a long time, this is not the first, second or third cycle. And your business, in my, you know, people ask me, you know, amongst friends, what do you do? I said, I'm a professional roller coaster rider. <laughs> because that's how it feels running a business in the immigration space. But I've been professionally doing it for 20 years and I'm still alive. I haven't yet crashed off a couple of times. Uh, you get very careful, and you learn each time. You learn business, and it's about business. It's about diversification. It's about assessing business risk. Uh, have you got too many eggs in one basket? Have you got too many with one visa product and one nationality? If you're in that space, you're going to get off the roller coaster and crash off. Uh, those things will always happen because that's what happens in the immigration space. So we want to sort of talk through some of that stuff. Um, we have a, a significant brains trust in the MIA generally. Um, MIA members give back to the institute and to new members a lot. Uh, we have a fantastic panel lineup. But before we do that, I'd like to just invite anyone in the room who has been an MIA board member to stand, please. Okay, anyone, keep standing. Anyone who's been on an MIA state committee at any time? So those of you who are new to the profession or new to the membership, look around. There's a lot of people here that have done a lot for your profession. And we want to draw on you guys today too. Get into the conversation. Don't just rely on us up the top here. There's a whole lot in the room that can lean on, uh, ask a question. Net the purpose of these conferences is to network. Walk away if you're a new agent, if you're a new member, you've been practicing for less than five years. Make sure you've got business cards from everybody in this room who you just saw stand up because we are not scary. We might be intimidating or scary late at night in the pub, but generally we're here to help and we're happy to take a phone call and other things. Mark Webster, you were a bit scary last night, but <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> So I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, uh, closest to me, Helen Duncan. Um, those of you who have uh, maybe done a PRP program in Queensland, Helen has been a MIA member for many years. Uh, she is a RMA. She has a practice. She's the director of Newland Chase in Brisbane. Uh, Helen's been an RMA for two, uh, since 2000 and before that was with the Department of Immigration. Uh, she's a former lecturer in the ANU Graduate Certificate course. Uh, she's uh, uh, been working in the MIA PRP program for many years, and she's also served on the national board. Um, Sarah Hatch, and, and I encourage everyone to look at the long profiles. However, if we were to read out the extended profiles of everyone that's in the uh, program, we'll be here all day, especially with David Prince's one. Um, Sarah Hatch is a solicitor and an RMA uh, and runs therefore two firms and has a solicitor practice, a law firm, as well as an RMA practice in Sydney. Uh, again, she's a long-term member of the, uh, of the Institute and participates and gives back to the Institute, especially when PRP students need to uh, go through, say, the, the mock trial hearings and things. Uh, Sarah's always putting a hand up to come in and assist and uh, pretend to and scare them in as a uh, fake AAT tribunal member. 
Um, but Sarah is a great advocate of the profession and has plenty of views around the effect on her business, say with the deregulation uh, of lawyers as well and the practical implications where someone's running both a solicitor's firm and an RMA practice. David Prince, we would hope would need no introduction, but we shall introduce David. Uh, David has been practicing in immigration since 1995. He is an accredited immigration specialist. Uh, he's a long-term member of the MIA, and he is also the chair of the Law Council of Australia's Immigration uh, Committee. Um, David is a great supporter of the MIA and has uh, provided enormous amount of mentoring to uh, new agents and lawyers over many years. So I'd like to um, start, start our proceedings off really with some general discussion questions for the panel. We'll start with the, the removal of lawyers uh, from registered registration. Uh, what we've discovered again this week is that the legislation is no lo not listed again. So when will that legislation go through? Um, what we do here, and we heard from Shane Newman this morning, that there's no opposition from the Labor Party on that. So it really is a matter that that legislation is, um, we'll, we'll get the, the votes. They're actually, the Labor Party is asking them to put it up to get on with the job as opposed to uh, any more blockage. So it, it's one of those things, we've, we've, there's been a lot of heated debate over this subject for many years, but it's there that you know it's gonna come in. What are the effects on various industries? Some agents, RMAs are fearful that 60,000 lawyers are gonna just descend in and, and take our business away. Is that a well-founded fear? I don't have that fear. I'm an RMA, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I know what I do is a lot better than a lot of lawyers and a lot of lawyers do their job a lot better than me. But I know one thing, for 20 years, lawyers have referred work to me and I've referred work to lawyers. Uh, you, you know where you're good at, what you're good at, and, you, and again, in the law profession, lawyers who aren't in immigration at all suddenly deciding to get into it would have rocks in their heads as the general view. There will be some, but there's a lot of, been a lot of discussion around it. Um, maybe we can open up that discussion and air what your concerns are and get some you know, rational discussion around it as well. Um, David, I might start with you. Um, you've been very actively advocating for the deregulation, uh, in particular on behalf of the Law Council and the Law Fraternity. Um, but what do you see is when that legislation comes in at some point, um, what's gonna be the effect on the RMA industry? Almost in nothing. Um, when I'm feeling a bit more insane than normal, you know, two or three times a week. Um, in Panic, I will read my two favourite authors, Douglas Adams and Terry Pratchett. Um, Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You've got the actual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You turn it on and what comes up in these really soft, comforting words is, don't panic. So as long as you have a, a, your own blanket and you have the don't panic in mind, you can get through anything, according to Douglas Adams. Um, I think what's been lost over the last 18 months, two years discussion of this issue is any nexus with reality. So let me just tell you um, this fear about the 66,000 lawyers in New South Wales alone, which there is, they're going to flood in and take your space. Let me just put that in perspective. So let's say today I employ a brand new solicitor. That solicitor has never studied migration law. They were admitted as a practitioner yesterday. So they have no knowledge, not one jot. They've never cracked open the act. Probably means they're more sane than most of us, but they have no knowledge. In order for them to come become a migration agent, they don't need to study anything at university. They don't need to do the grad cert or the grad diff. They just pay the MARA fee, 1500 bucks. They don't need to do any immigration CPD. They don't need to do any PRP. They don't have to do any of that because they're ruled by the law societies which make the MARA look like kindergarten students. You think the MARA is tough, you've never been a lawyer. You've never had the law, the law society on your tail or the legal services commissioner or a trust inspector. The worst the MARA can do is take away your practice, that's your, your registration. Legal services commission can order compensation, they can come and they can, they can ruin your life. So the only thing right now that stands in the way of 66,000 lawyers 
all doing migration work, the only thing is 1500 bucks. That's it. All right. So much of the debate before the Senate was just parallel universe stuff from my perspective. But, oh, you know, these lawyers come in and they don't have to do much, they don't know very much. Well, it's just another area of law for us. Our ethical rules require us to have all these things in place. That is, I can't take work unless I'm competent and I've got the capacity and, and knowledge. So right now, if any of these 66,000 lawyers wanted to do migration work, they could do it right now for 1,500 bucks. That's it. What's stopping them? Lack of interest in the area. It's, that doesn't fit with their practice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you get it in perspective. Um, and so when dual regulation ends, it'll make me happy because I won't need to register as an agent anymore. I can just be what I am, which is a lawyer. And will there be some lawyers who come into the space who don't currently practice? Yep, of course there will be. And for every one of your cases that might be affected by that, there'll be 200 cases affected by changes to the law. When I say impact upon agents, dual regulation won't touch you. Changes to the 457, genuine temporary entrant, there's a big change to your, your practice. Dual regulation is a complete and utter storm in the teacup. It simply means agents are agents and lawyers are lawyers. Um, and I've been a member of MIA for 20 years and I haven't needed to be at any time but I am because it's a fantastic organisation and not being an agent won't change that a jot. It just meant the MIA thankfully changed their constitution to remove the need that you have to be an agent historically to be a MIA member. So you've got to get it in perspective. The people who will be affected the most, people like Sarah <coughs> and um, Nigel Dobby who've got the dual practice, then you've got the law firm and the agent because it lowers your professional indemnity insurance. My professional indemnity insurance, you think you pay a lot? Mine's about $45,000 every March. So a couple hundred bucks in PII, you don't know what that's an expense is. So for Sarah, who's a lawyer, so you don't have to feel any sympathy at all, um, <laughs> Sarah will be affected as far as managing that, but um, it's actually the lawyers who will be affected mm. rather than 99.99% for a beta percent of agents. So don't panic. Sarah, <laughs> good segue panic. into Sarah then, because you've now, you've exactly that. Sarah, you've operated in both universities. Mm. So... Yes, we are the ones who are the most affected and typically the reason it was done that way is that you have your big corporate clients who are doing you know, 30, 40 nominations at a time and they're $500 nominations and they do not involve anything other than form filling. Um, to, as David said, to pay you know, law society professional indemnity on that is absolutely crazy compared to what you pay for, for migration work. Um, the way you have to work it, it's, it's a tricky area because what you do is you say anything that's straight down the line migration form filling stuff goes into the migration practice. Um, our approach has been as soon as we look at something and we have an idea that our strategy is going to involve going to the AAT, we put it into the law practice at a starting point. So I'm not transferring files particularly. But it's a big impact in terms of, of the cost factor of insurance for me going forward. Uh, I'm still working out where we're going to go with it. As David says, I think I prefer Omara to, to the freaking other one, that one. Um, so I might well end up just giving up a practicing certificate and just become a, an agent. In terms of other things, I actually think it's really good news for agents. Um, I think there's a perception out there that lawyers charge more than agents do. And so if you've got a very complicated case, okay, I'll go to a lawyer. Where I've had cases where we don't charge anywhere more than a number of, of agents, but the perception is you're a lawyer, you'll be more expensive. So I don't think there's a problem with that at all. In terms of what Jonathan said, I think that's exactly how it's been. I am often on the phone to David saying I'm referring this, this is beyond my competence. I don't want to touch it, can I send it to you? I don't think it'll be any different. And, and it shouldn't be because by whichever code you live by, you aren't allowed to give advice if it's outside your area of competence. And I think a final comment on how many lawyers are going to bounce in there. I don't know any lawyers who don't, haven't specialized in tax, who've picked up the Tax Act and thought it's a good idea because someone phoned today and asked me about tax to suddenly give tax advice because I can. It's crazy. Following on from, uh, from tax law, migration law is the most complicated area 
of law. It's certainly not going to, to be there. So I'm with David, as long as you've got the blanket, don't panic, unless you're me. And if you've got any ideas for me, please come and tell me how to solve them. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. So Helen, uh, coming from the RMA uh, business practice uh, perspective, what do you, what, what concerns or not concerns you have uh, for the industry and your practice? I suppose I agree with everyone. I, we're not particularly worried about what, what it will mean for us. Um, I think, like Sarah has pointed out, I think the, um, the, the lawyers who also have a man who perhaps don't have a unrestricted practicing certificate, I think they are the ones that are probably going to be most affected. Um, also, I guess the lawyers suddenly, um, they're the ones with more competition rather than, you know, someone who's an RMA. And I know we, we do track where our clients come from. We actually get about, you know, 20% of our clients that go to the Mara website. So it's a well-known website. People go and actually look for people on that. And we're going to be the only ones on there now. Um, so, and I know for lawyers, they can't really advertise that they do migration work unless they're an accredited specialist. Would that be right? No, or? you just can't use Terms. Certain yeah. terms. Certain yeah. terms. Yeah. If you call yourself a specialist and you're not, you're in trouble. The law says yes. you have to be yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, without lawyers who perhaps aren't an accredited specialist and suddenly don't have a man, it's probably going to be a bit more difficult for them to say, well, we do migration work. I, I don't know. But I mean, I think the whole discussion or the whole delay in this um, has been a real problem for firms like mine. I've lost, and I know other firms have, we've lost really good staff who are lawyers who have panicked even though they was a dope panic, and actually gone and said, no, I want to be a lawyer, and I've, they've left and gone to work for law firms. And, and I know I'm not the only one who has lost good staff because suddenly they think, oh, well, I've got to choose soon, either give up my practising certificate or, or um, you know, leave. And so uh, the delay has been incredible. That's probably been the worst thing mm -hmm. is, is, and, you know, I was speaking to someone the other day who phoned up Mara who asked, because uh, her... Her man was due for renewal, and she's a lawyer as well. And, and Mara's view was, renew your man because we don't think this is ever going to happen. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I mean, if it's not down again, I mean, who? Yeah, it's just got to be one or the other, and, and it's the, it's the delay I think that's causing more of a problem. Just than keep getting bumped by, you know, yeah. needles and strawberry bills and <laughs> stuff like that. And <laughs> the really important. The find the lost cat bill, all those really important things. Yeah. Do you think it will ever happen, though, David? Do you think it will happen? I'm just looking for the slow news day where the Senate has <laughs> nothing to do and the government of the day need to be seen to be doing something. Get that, get that migration agent thing whacked back through so we look useful on the, on the 6 o'clock news. Mm -hmm. OK, we might, I've got a question over here first, Sandra. We'll take some questions now. Um, yes, please. I understand that you feel that there's need to deregulate because lawyers are overregulated, but wouldn't a better solution would be to allow pr uh, legal practitioners, if they chose, to also keep their MARA. Let me because be we're, we're about to lose one of, well, if, we, we're in the same boat as Helen, one of our best agents has never worked in a law firm, does not want to work in a law firm, has been a MARA agent for 16 years and a legal practitioner. But the idea of giving up her legal practice, practicing certificate just to take the MARA is really difficult for her, like she's agonising over it. In one sense, the answer is it just doesn't matter what I think or you think. It's people happening. forget it's a government decision. I'm sure most people in this room weren't thrilled about the government making changes to 457. But aren't you lobbying for it? Couldn't you lobby for the other, the opt-in? You, you don't understand. Government made decisions. It's been made a long time ago. Now, the Law Society, the Law Council never advocated for, for that position. It came out of actually nowhere. Um, when the government said we've made this decision, um, I thought, well, that's interesting, where did that come from? The more I thought about it, my personal view is I kind of make, from a, the government's perspective was from the public interest. Put aside the, the practitioner's interest, because that was way down their order of what we're interested in. The whole point was, um, the, two, the two reasons for the change were um, reduction of red tape. That was a big thing when the Liberals first took power of ALP, um, and also public protection. And there's a lot of problems, a lot of people who've fallen through the cracks between is this a MARA matter, is this a, is this a law society matter, is it legal services commissioner? And there's some awful cases of solicitors who have managed to get through because the law, count, the law societies weren't going after them because they would have been dead in the water straight away. But the MARA took four years. 
Um, and so from a public perception is you're an agent, you go here. If you're not an agent, you go here. And so that's a big driver. And so the, the purity of that made a lot of sense to me. But the Law Council never advocated for that position. But understand, government makes decisions. And the decision's been made and this, you've had years of notice. Mm -hmm. So far it's been it's three and a half years. And even if it goes to in the November sittings of Senate, it's gonna be a one July start. So I can't think of any other change to the professions where there's been so much advance notice. Um, so in one sense, it just doesn't matter what I think about the topic. Sometimes in life is, that's what government's gonna do, unless it just never, well, it may gets never to the Senate. <laughs> um, so put aside this, that, that reality, but um, everyone's for it the change, like other than the Green. Violence provisions bill. Yeah, exactly. So it's one of those things in life that I've got a view, but it doesn't really matter what my view is. Sometimes in, in, our, in our professional life, it's just, you've got to suck it up and, and plan for it and deal with it. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Angela. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, everyone. Um, that, that actual bill was on the agenda to be um, read, to be passed on Thursday, but it got knocked off, bumped off on Wednesday. Mm. Um, mm. It won't be going back until November. November? Mm. First week of November or something? 12th. 12th of November, that's right, yeah. Um, but, you know, whether it survives that, I don't know. Uh, look, when, when all of this first came up with Kendall and everything, I did propose to the Law Council that we work together on this because um, I said, you know, as far as regulation goes, um, um, I didn't see any point in um, lawyers um, having to pay a registration fee twice, you know, and, and um, be subject to um, the um, dual regulation and disciplinary. However, I did say that what we would work towards, and this was with Erskine Roden, was that um, uh, why don't we just try and keep lawyers on the register and have them not um, pay their fees, but that they be able to be on the register. Now, unfortunately, that wasn't sustained. That argument wasn't carried through by the Law Council. And um, so, and this is, this is where that came from. It didn't not but it's just, come It's just one nowhere. of those rare issues that we don't agree on. I mean, yeah. well, it's, no. it's one of the few, and it's, the thing is, the vast majority of lawyers, we just don't want to be agents. Like, yeah, but the thing is, all. the thing is, like, is that, ever. yeah. I'm a lawyer, that's what but I But it, it would have helped those people and those lawyers who also have been on the register, and as Helen said, you know, people go and check the MARA register, at least they would still be on the register. Um, but once the bill goes through, they will no longer be on the register. Anyway, that's gone, that's by the by. But what I have proposed to um, uh, the parties is that they do bring in an amendment to the bill, and that is that, the, that there be a review after three years, and that was the actual recommendation by the Productivity Commission, that there be a review of the whole uh, system um, not including lawyers to see what happens um, in three years time. So I don't know whether that's going to happen, but I think it's um, on the agenda. All right, good. Any other questions to that topic? Yes, sir. Um, my name's Angela DeMarco and um, I do have some concerns about um, the change. And I do think it is going to impact migration agents. Um, I have already spoken to a number of relatively new law graduates who've just been out of law school for a couple of years who have indicated to me um, that this is something that they might be interested in um, dabbling in if um, their work isn't going so well. And my concern is actually for the client. Um, because I suspect that there will be more incidences where people may um, perhaps find themselves working with a lawyer, um, believing that they are highly knowledgeable about migration law and perhaps they may not be. Um, that's probably where my concern may be. We might find ourselves having more work in terms of perhaps fixing problems. So yeah. um, I, I do think oh, that there may be an issue. <laughs> um, and, great. you know, the fact that's that any lawyer now can actually, if they wish to, practice migration law, um, uh, whilst they might become very specialised over time and so on, but 
you know, it is, they have to start somewhere and that does concern me. Angela, just on, on that, um, I mean, th th as David said though, that is the situation now, mm. you know, no and, and what this bill is going to change is going to stop that because those people cannot practice as lawyers unless they have an um, unrestricted practising certificate. Mm. So it will force those people who are now exactly able to do that. And I think that, it, I think that is a problem that people yeah, do it now. Do it now. <laughs> mm. um, but it will stop that because they will um, now have to go and join a law firm and have the mentoring and everything else that goes with having... Otherwise um, they've committed criminal offences. That's right. Mm. So I think it will actually solve that rather than it become a problem. No, but new, no, new but graduates don't graduate have that. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to a new agent who's done a graduate certificate yeah. and is doing a PRP. Now yeah, there's no problem there, is there? So if there's <laughs> one lawyer concerned there, there's a thousand agents over there. Mm. All right, cool. Roman, you got a question? No, I haven't got a question. I've got a statement, though. <laughs> <laughs> you always do. No, I just want to tell you um, a couple of examples from the MIA, as you know, we run Immigration Essentials for Lawyers, for lawyers who have not had any immigration background. And also, this, um, as this was, we were starting to get people ringing us up, saying, I'm a lawyer, I think I might want to go into this area of migration. Mm. And in the absence of not having um, a, a more practical course at the time, we let three lawyers into PRP, Practice Ready Program. Cool. Two of them freaked out straight away <laughs> and, and left because they didn't know what ANSCO was, they didn't know what skilled occupation is, but they, they just didn't know what uh, um, legend, all of that sort of stuff. They just went, well. And we've also stood there when we've had immigration essentials for lawyers, where we've had lawyers have gone, no, no, this is not for me. So it's not the fact that, yes, the, all these things can happen, but and they might think it, but when they actually see it, and what's involved, a lot of them run screaming in the opposite direction. And it was really common, Helen and I taught together at ANU, the grad cert for many years, a lot of lawyers did that course. Mm. Didn't mm. need to, and a lot of lawyers paid significant sums of money to do that course and to do the immigration essentials for lawyers at the MIA. Why? Basic ethical rule lawyers have to, to, to raise, is what both my colleagues have raised, is do I have the competence to do it? And to these lawyers who didn't need to do those courses, from a regulatory perspective, paid money to do it because they said we don't yet feel confident we've got the knowledge, we'll spend money to learn. So there's a good example of how ethic, you, you just can't compare the ethical rules of agents are a paper cut compared to the beheading that the law societies give us on our ethical rules. Um, and so that's a really common thing. Someone has to move into tax, they say, well, I don't know, don't know a jot about tax, I'll go and do a master's in tax. I'll go and do all this CPD in tax. And that's a common thing. There will always be some cowboys mm. in any occupation. Um, but I agree with Helen, I think that it, the deregulation snobs out a big part exactly. of that particular problem. Exactly. Rather the ones than who causing it. That's right. The, the graduates who think, oh, well, I can't get another job, I'll just start a migration agency. Yep. You know, and that's what's happening now. Question of it. Yeah, hi. This is Con Con Paxanos here. I just wanted to ask what the practical, how it might work, and I don't know if there are any issues, but if an RMA works for a lawyer with an unrestricted practicing certificate, that is, he's working for a law firm, but he or she is an RMA, are they acting in the capacity of an RMA under OMARA, or are they acting as a representative of the law firm, and how that might work? if you could just explain if there's any issue there that needs to be explained or... Ha are Sarah, there do you want to...? No, I don't want to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what we're worrying about. I, I can answer that because we've been on a discussion. Be on there's both because OMARA registers practitioners individually yeah. mm -hmm. and so an individual um, agent has responsibility. So if you're an agent, regardless of how you're working, you've got, you're subject to the OMARA. But if you're working for my law firm, See, lawyers, we're jointly and severally responsible. As an individual solicitor, I've got responsibilities. And my law firm has responsibilities. Technically, my law firm is itself the holder of a practising certificate. But there has to be at least one lawyer who signs off saying, yeah, the buck stops with me. So any staff member who works with me comes under my responsibility. 
So if I employ an agent, let's let give you a hypothetical situation, a law firm who's got not one jot of experience in expertise in migration, and they employ an agent, I can tell you the not, agent's not going to be well supervised, and that's a crazy principal solicitor who takes, who let a staff member work in an area of law that they don't know anything about. That's just a law cover claim waiting to perform them. Um, and so I'm responsible, as a lawyer, I'm responsible for their work. And so, anything so they what, do what is done by my firm. Hang on, let me finish. And so anything, any mistake they made, that's on my, okay. on, my on my insurance, which covers several million dollars, as opposed to your migration agent's registration, which covers a couple, couple, couple hundred thousand. Doesn't change the fact that that agent also will have individual responsibilities. Yeah, right? If they're negligent, I, as the principal solicitor, could cop it through the Legal Services Commissioner, but that agent may also have exposure to the OMARA um, for their breach of code of conduct. Are you suggesting that there's a greater risk that there would be a law cover claim or a negligent action if the law firm employed an RMA versus a lawyer? No sane client would pursue an OMARA complaint when they could to the, the law society. <laughs> Because the worst the Mara can do is take away the agent's registration. That's it. How much does that help the punter? The Legal Services Commission can order me to pay compensation, um, do legal work for free, to do a whole bunch of things. It's, at the moment, I just don't understand why someone would want to make a Mara complaint when they can pursue me as a lawyer. It's ridiculous. A lot more to lose is what you're saying. Mm. That's why insurance is there to protect my, my clients. So if, if I do a runner, if I'm dead, the insurance still protects them. Okay. This question over. Sorry, Philip. Yeah. He wouldn't dare disagree with me. Sorry. I know. <coughs> Hopefully, it's gone. It's just <laughs> asked me to change the subject. Um, but uh, actually, I, I wanted to add a little comment to to that question. It's my. New Zealand, where um, this model came from, uh, that, that lawyers could not be registered as agents, the regulatory authority there, the registration authority, will not register uh, individuals who work for a law firm, even if they don't hold a legal practicing certificate, um, for, for that uh, reason of conflict. And the other thing that I, I it, it just raises more questions, I guess, really. I don't really know the answer, but there is at least a suggestion that the legal insurers uh, would be very uncomfortable with a lawyer who had someone who was differently um, uh, supervised working for them under a, mm -hmm. under a completely different set of rules. Mm -hmm. And they might take that into account in setting any premium for a firm that looked like that. Oh, good. I think we will move the subject now. We've um, mm -hmm. got a bit more. Oh, okay. Last question on this subject. It's, it's more of a, an observation rather than a question. But we've, I've, I'm from Perth, and we've had um, really good relations between the migration agents and the lawyers over the years. But Ooh. I actually know three law firms who've decided not to bother with migration at all anymore. They just can't be bothered. They're Ooh. referring business to us now. Ooh. And I don't think we've got anything to fear from lawyers at all, because, you know, as David said, if they want to do it, they're going to do it anyway. Hmm. Okay. It's really common. I mean, I, I, as Helen has had this, I mean, lots of work has been referred from lawyers to Helen. I refer work to Helen. Someone calls me from Brisbane and says, well, why did, I said, what, what? Let me finish. Someone who's got a 501 out of Brisbane and said, why do you want me to run it? <laughs> Sorry, you need someone local, so I'll go and talk to uh, Helen and Philip. Um, and so it happens routinely. Um, and I think a good thing to do for agencies is have a strong relationship with lawyers, that you can, people you work with routinely, it's really common, people read me a matter, so if judicial, they, they've lost at the tribunal, the agent's done a good job, but they had a, a thick member, happens all the time. By definition of thickness, they don't agree with me, they must be <laughs> thick. And then I run the judicial review, the Federal Circuit Court win it, and 10 the clients straight back to my, the agent who's brought me the matter to run the tribunal. It's really common and there's a lot of positive who, collegiate work. The, the things coming up, the future, artificial intelligence. Um, 
with the department. Um, no comment. The simplification and artificial intelligence that they've been talking about, we've seen, uh, and as Shane Newman did discuss this morning, it seems to have gone a bit more quiet on that front too. But there has been some newspaper reports more recently around the tender process and the companies uh, involved in it. It is looking like you know a billion dollar tender process, Australia Post and large large entities coming into that space. The privatisation of case officer uh, as, you know work is essentially uh, what the current government's proposing. What we heard this morning, of course, from a Labor government is that there's a desire to protect that, especially given the public the influence of a public sector union. Um, but at some point, you know, we, we're seeing those that that model introduced in a range of business practices. Anyway, it's inevitable that certain areas of day-to-day uh, -day decision making, especially the objective area of decision making, uh, will be put into an algorithm and put into a, you know, auto, we're already seeing auto grants on SBS renewals. We're seeing auto grants on low, uh, low risk student visa profiles, and we have for some time now. Uh, we've seen e auto grants on ETAs for, for donkeys. Uh, so it's nothing new, it's just going wider. Is this something that we need to fear? Um, what, what do you, you know, what are the perceptions of it? Given there's not a lot of information there, but it's a, it's a good idea to get hold of on the department's website some of the information that is there to try to understand where they're going with it. But is it something that's going to put us out of business, or is it something more designed to put case officers out of business? Um, wh wh what's the what's the views of that from from the panel's point of view? Where do you where do we sit, just from our own practice looking forward, changing business models? Are we panicking about that? If it does come in, will it come in? How would they even bring it in? How long would it take to come in? Sarah. Don't even just bits on it again. Um, don't panic. My view is I love the auto grants. As long as you know exactly what is required, and it's pretty simple. You sit with your regs, you understand them, you make sure it's putting a square block into a square hole. And it comes through, as we've seen with the SBSs, with six hours, three hours, you get an auto approval. Now, that's fabulous because it's the simple line of business that you know exactly what to do. I think the important thing is that, that the department is incredibly transparent about the algorithms. So we know exactly what it is that we need, you know, which boxes we need to be ticking. And um, the negative could be if you get too, many, too few case officers and the lo workload goes up. But my view would be you'll be taking a lot of routine, easy decisions out of the hands of case officers who often will screw it up in the process of making something which shouldn't be difficult. You'll get consistency. I mean, how wonderful, I was talking to a colleague the other day, she had done three nominations for the same company for exactly the same positions. Two of them approved and one of them refused on genuine need. So, but exactly the same different case officers. You won't get that kind of inconsistency. Then it frees up the case officers to look at the cases where you actually do need someone to look at it and think about it. So I'm, I really don't think we need to be worrying. I think case officers should look out for their jobs on that one. But from our perspective, yeah, great. That falls into this box. We charge in that box. This falls into this box. We're going to spend more time on it. Helen, what do you think? Um, Look, I think a lot of people don't, I, I mean, a lot of people don't know about auto grants. So I think we're in a bit of a sweet spot. But I think yeah. one, once businesses do realise that SBSs are auto grants, uh, why would they come, come to, to us, us, you know? And so I think it is something, and of all the topics, I think this is probably one that I'm most concerned about. As Jonathan said, there's just not a lot of information about what's going to happen. You know, the outsourcing, where's it going? Who's going to be doing it, you know? Um, and I think that's, that's a concern. However, you know, when Skill Select came in years ago now, I know lots and lots of agents were really concerned about, you know, oh, gee, you know, this is going to put us out of business. People are going to do their own. And I think that has not happened. I mean, it's something that, you know, people realise that you've got to put the right information in to get the right outcome. And people maybe did it themselves at first, but now they realise, yeah, it is important to understand what each question is, because if you don't answer each question correctly. so. Some of the artificial intelligence I'm not so worried about. I mean, visa simplification is just an oxymoron, you know. I mean, 
Um, has anyone seen anything that's become simpler? You know, um, I think <laughs> nominations now, I can't imagine any company actually doing their own nomination anymore. Oh, yeah. um, there is so many legislative instruments and all these other requirements that, have, that go with a, um, a 482 nomination that, yeah, I, I think it's become harder and, and maybe some things will become simpler, but I think where our work, and I think that's something that people need to think about, I think our work's gonna become more complex. Yeah, I think that, I mean, a couple of observations. The, I think the primary motivation here is to remove labour, human beings being employed by the Commonwealth. Go back pre-online application. There was physical application forms. So you do an application form, like on a 143 country parent now, you send it off to Perth. It gets to Perth. There's an immigration officer at their end typing into the system all that clerical stuff. When you had online applications, we're doing that. It's like when he went to typewriters computers, there was massive job losses. They didn't need a typing tool anymore. Okay, I, started, I started when I was four years old in this area when we still had typewriters. We'd get into the department, was that the Rocks? You actually or used to have offices at Rockdale and, and Parramatta at the other side, Chatswood. And you'd physically get, the, the staff would come back with boxes of forms. Mm. And you'd Pull this, you have a piece of paper and it, you know, thick paper, it's like this, and you pull the, the paper clips out, the staples, and you literally you know, put the page, you can see you know, one page, you've got four pages, and you put it to the typewriter, type, make a mistake, bugger, tear up, start again. <laughs> um, and so that meant the Commonwealth could sack a lot of people. Mm. We didn't need them. And so I think that's a primary motivator here, is to we don't, we remove labour. We did a CPD and we had Gilbert and Tobin, big law firm, and they specialised in IT. We had their IT guru come along, I understood one word in five that he said. Um, but we asked him, I asked him this question, you've got these two broad imperatives from the Commonwealth. They want him to have the use of artificial intelligence and automatic decision-making algorithms, coupled with simplification of visa programs. And I said, um, and there was this big, it was just after the big tender document went out, and I said, do you think what do you think of the good tender document? What do you think about the tender document? And this is the IT perspective. He said, I think it's a good marketing document. Translation, the person who wrote this doesn't have the smallest idea at all what they're talking about. Because the only way you can have broad simplification of visa categories is to have big discretion. Yep. Mm, mm. That is, visa to visa, we give you a visa to visa if you want. What can't you automate? Discretion. Right, so let's take a resident return visa. We've got two categories, the easy, you've lived to two years and five. We can auto grant that, because that's the, there's no discretion, it's just a calculation. Number of days, they've got the data in the system with movements records, bang, auto grant. What, what can't we auto grant? The do you have substantial ties in Australia which are of benefit, yada, yada. So I think the parts of the program that don't require us mm. are the very things that are most readily yeah. automatable. An ETA is an example. Mm. There's about 10 questions in an ETA. That's it. It's the things that require thought and evidence and a weighing up or a discretion where we're needed. And that's what Sarah's mm. saying is that ideally, if, the, if, if, we have, if we employ the same number of human beings mm. and they don't have to waste their time on this easy stuff, and actually put them over here weighing up discretions. And so if you want to protect your practice, don't have a practice of doing lots of easy visitor visas. Because yeah, that, if you're doing that, then you're exposed to a lot of your business being lost. If you want to maintain your business, it's those areas where your skills are actually needed and that's the hardest thing to have AI on. I'm not saying they can't do it, but it's, it's a long time away and it's the, the late, it's the last thing that'll be automated. Thank you. Questions? Ivan. Yeah, so just to make comments on this, um, I don't believe there's reason to fear with automation it, it certainly could result in efficiency in, s in terms of processing. But I recall some years ago, the department came out with this concept of Visa Wizard on their own website. <laughs> and there was this massive panic around uh, saying, well, there's no role for a migration agent. The garbage that came out of that when clients sort of tried to self-assess, they all got it wrong. And so it was always going to be a role for a competent migration agent. So that the key is to maintain their professionalism and their expertise because they clients simply cannot do it themselves. And they've seen many examples where they've got it wrong. The other classic example was years ago, 
when they introduced the concept, you know, the skills assessment on the uh, 189, 190 and the previous uh, forms of that, there was a significant um, increase in the refusals out of the UK. And the reason being, the UK said, we speak English, we'll do this ourselves. And then afterwards, they said, I don't know how to do a skills assessment. You know, it's, so what I'm saying is the focus is not to worry about the noise around us. Stake, if you say keep com you know, you're competent, you know what you're doing, the clients will sort of come back. You know, there'll always be hiccups along the way, but it's, you know, it's still a professional area. It's a very, very complicated area. I mean, I relate to Sarah's comment about the tax because I did both as well. <laughs> it's so true. You know, it's, it's ever-changing. It's complicated. Clients cannot work it out themselves. So it's, you know, in certainly, sta you know, maybe the visitor visas might be automated, so there's no real professional work there. But the rest of it, there's always going to be a role. So. Any other questions? Nick, please, thanks. Thank you. Two things that um, do worry me in this sort of broad scope of um, issues. The first one is, I fear that visa simplification is actually code for um, something they've talked about a few times, which is the idea of taking permanent residency off the table mm. for new arrivals. And you can simplify the visa system by saying we've gotten rid of however many there are at the moment, 100 different forms of permanent residency and only have one. And that is the one that someone gets after they've lived in Australia for four years, 10 years, whatever the government of the time wants. Um, and met a whole bunch of additional criteria before we'll give them PR. I think that that is festering, that idea. It certainly comes up every now and then. You see it get thrown out to the News Limited press and then they wait and see what kind of reaction they get. Um, from a settlement perspective, very frightening. Um, the other one through the outsourcing is, again, we don't really have much detail, but the fact that it gets talked about the idea that people will be able to pay a premium to get fast track processing. And that suddenly introduces the concept that the richer you are, the faster you'll get the visa that you want. Um, and I think that yeah, is a really big concern. I think you know, two areas where we are moving away from what has traditionally been a non-discriminatory immigration program um, that judge people on their qualities, not the amount of money they had in their wallet. That's just my two cents. And we've seen an example of that with the um, visa to visas out of China, haven't we? Pay a huge fee. Mm. non-refundable um, so I agree that there's we've got one taste of that I don't know what the numbers are in that visa category mm. but it's um, that was concerning I have to say mm. well, we know that certainly the Libs want to remove all they've tried three times to remove all parent visas mm. completely they'd love to see them gone and just replaced with a rolling five-year temporary parent visa with no Medicare or mm. Centrelink benefits um, what what do we do in our businesses? Um, how can we see those things coming? Some of those reforms no one saw coming. They, you get blindsided in an April um, afternoon. I think a client of mine rang me up um, and told me about it because it, it just hit the newspaper um, along with the citizenship announcements. So there was a deliberate move to blindside the department itself um, when we actually went into that to find out how many people in the department knew about it. They didn't either. It was very politically motivated. But um, at other times, you can also see, you know, the, the conversation that's coming out is very much regional, regional, regional now. We hear it on the, in the papers. Uh, we've heard it all yesterday and today as well. Um, I've been telling clients of mine for two years in this, especially in the student space, like Melanie was saying, regional. I mean, for me, that's not a new concept. It's been a no-brainer for a long time, as we've seen the contraction in just the way Skill Select operates um, and the opportunities and different uh, incentives that the states have always had under their state migration plans. The Northern Territory is a classic. Um, you know, 15 years ago, that we used to have a um, Ford GTE. The Northern Territory Government, uh, the Charles Darwin Uni, the Australian Government and Austrade, and me as an RMA presenting the PowerPoints in Bangladesh, it said study and stay. And the Northern Territory Government had an MOU with Charles Darwin Uni to promote its migration pathways. That's in 2006, well before the night review. And that was done actually responsibly. That was the message with the principal migration officer of the Australian High Commission chaired the whole thing. Um, they had very clear pathways. 
So there wasn't scams and stuff. But then all that went to mess because uh, as the student pathways became sold as a guaranteed PR, the whole thing went to hell. Um, but it's quite clear, you've got to guide, your, your clients are coming to us, it's getting more complicated. Now that's good for business too. It's more, you've got to value your advice. Um, the idea of free consultations is complete madness. Um, the idea of giving quality advice and giving people cautious advice and making sure that they've understood uh, along the way there are opportunities but things will continue to change and they've got to be able to change with that. Uh, that means changing location, changing study to a different location, changing up their English is a no-brainer, having to get work experience. Um, you've got to be able to crystal ball it. You've got to be able to work out where is that person going to be, whether they're an employee or whether they're a student, two, three, four years from now. And they're asking that question. What do I do? You, you can't say you're going to have this outcome. But you're asked to at least um, try to predict. And so we talk about it in that crystal ball uh, and responsible crystal ball gazing. Um, but in this environment, how do you as practitioners, I call it polish your ball, crystal ball, um, the, how do you keep that, your knowledge up to date to try to predict? What are the things you're doing in your own business? What strategies you have around it beyond just looking at the regs and other things? How are you keeping yourself up to date with the political mood, the barometer of the country? Uh, are you really up to date with really where the politics are and understand what's underneath and motivating some of that political debate, which will then translate into various legislative outcomes, which will then affect your, the outcomes for your clients. Uh, it's clear that there's a very strong push for regional Australia. Some of that's going to be of benefit to agents who at the moment are in regional Australia suffering because they've got no more RSMS work. But suddenly you're going to find us in the metropolitans going, well, there's no ENS work or TSS work. Uh, and they've created a whole new visa code that benefits regional Australia. And you're sitting in regional Australia, your clients are going to, there's a lot more work there too. That's coming. Um, and they'll come regardless of the change of government because that's just clearly a no-brainer. You've got to find ways to, to move. We've tried for you know, decades and decades to repopulate in you know, regional Australia and you keep getting that magnet coming back to Sydney and Melbourne and, and Queensland, etc. In your business practices, what do you do to keep yourself completely across what the future might hold? Um, how do you deal with change when it blindsides us? What are the things you do? Do you just go, don't panic? Sometimes you do have mm. to panic. Um, but what are the practical things too, from a business perspective that we can do uh, and to keep staff, you know, because sometimes it means it's, you know, people need to downsize too, some people. Um, and then businesses also can be at a point where they can be uh, crashed and go insolvent. Um, we're business owners and operators in the first and foremost. What are we doing about our risk analysis? Go on. Um, you know, I, I guess I feel for people who are practicing by themselves and, um, you know, I've done that as well and um, I know that it's, it's difficult to have that communication with other agents and uh, I, I just think that that communication, if you are practicing by yourself, and it's still the majority of, of the registered agents are still sole practitioners. I think you've got to develop a network and, and whether it means actually co-locating, you know, there's a lot of those innovation hubs now where people from different firms sit in the one space. They've all got their own desks, but in fact, there's a lot of sharing of ideas. And I, I, for me, I, I sort of, you know, would think that sole practitioners <laughs> Would, would want that sort of interaction with other, with other agents because I think it's really difficult to stay on top of, you know, the legislation, the policy, the procedures, everything is, is really difficult if you're, if you're by yourself. So um, I suppose that's what we do. We do a lot of communication in, in the, the organisation to, to try to keep up and talk about and, you know, realise that you can't say, well, I don't do those visas, you know, I only do these. I think that's, that, that's a danger. You've got to keep up with everything, which is really difficult, I know. But I think it's really important to make sure that because, you know, suddenly, um, you know, uh, something goes, you know, GSM, I don't know, none of the politicians this morning seem to talk a lot about GSM. They talked about family and humanitarian employer sponsored. But I mean, that's the one that I guess sits out on a bit of a limb. 
um, you know, if suddenly GSM went, what, what are you going to do? And if that's all you do, then, you know, th that could be a real problem. So I guess try to keep across, but it's hard to do if you don't have that interaction with other, with other migration agents. And we've seen GSM go that way before. We saw we 2012 yep. where it just ceased. And then the introduction of Skills Select was delayed by about six months um, because of the IT behind it wasn't ready. So then there's just no invitation. So the whole thing fell off a cliff. The thing that concerned me back then, Kevin Lane and I did the CPD, we did a roadshow around Australia for the MIA on those, up, those changes that were coming up back in 2012 where, you know, they look very similar and different to what's happened now, which is skilled list changing and suddenly, uh, and then transitional arrangements were all very confusing. I did a seminar in Melbourne and we asked all the, everyone in the room, how many, uh, you know, put your hand in the air if you have 10 or more nationalities on your books. And the majority of the agents in the room had two or three maximum nationalities on their books. My books, we've got 95 nationalities and I'm trying to get to that 100 because <laughs> that to me is the most important thing. That diversity of nationality on your books brings all sorts of other clients to you. If you focus too much on just one or two markets, I did that years ago, it was called Bangladesh. We had one market, one product, student visas out of Bangladesh. And it wasn't the Australian government, it was the Bangladeshi government that decided to have a meltdown and the whole country went to hell. We couldn't operate, we couldn't take unis there. It was just uh, strikes, it was unsafe, you had to shut down. We shut down overnight after eight years of successful double digit growth and cut 80% of our income straight away. All the Bangladeshi guys we bring into Australia brought their flatmates. And they brought a Russian and a Moldovan in too. And you suddenly had, you went sideways and your business continue to grow, but you learn a very hard lesson. Don't just have those things. GSM changes in 2012, did the same thing to a lot of agents. 457 TSS, RSMS, same thing. People just got two or three types of employees and two or three types of uh, occupations and, and products. They suddenly find themselves in a whole lot of pain again. If you're running a business, that's the worst business model to have in any industry. You've got to have that diversification and, and multiple products to sell. Sarah. There was a period where you could choose, I'm a corporate person. We do TS457s, ENSs, or I'm in the GSM area or in the student. That's just not an option. I think what we all have to do is you have to look at each person as they walk in the door and go to, to Jonathan's point, that absolutely you have to charge for consultations. Someone comes in the door and you start with a blank piece of paper. What are your options? What are the strategies? So it's no good if the only thing you know is a 457 or a 482. These more creative, different visas need to be found. And a really good way, which I did a while ago, to go back to it, is just to go into Legend and actually run through the, the current visa categories. You know, 407s, 408s, other ones. You can't afford only to have one solution because each person needs to be viewed individually and I think that goes to Jonathan's point across across nationalities so that's a really big point on Helen's one I'm a member of two organizations with current technology whatsapps etc it's really easy to be in contact with other agents and it's really easy to share it's an incredibly collegiate group which I'm very very fortunate to be part of both of them so I strongly say to people, make sure you do that. Start up one yourselves. Find areas that you're unsure of or, or want to get into. I go to the MIA to keep up to date, otherwise I phone David. That's how it goes, it's pretty simple. Um, but in general, I think the other point is you have to be listening to clients on all sorts. You've got to have a very, very wide bandwidth. Width. And with that, goes the issue of be careful, you know, that you're not stepping into advice outside of the migration advice, you're not suddenly giving them settlement advice and this and this. But it's not enough just to say, I know this about these visas. And I think that's, it's exciting, it's scary, but it's also actually really exciting and it's so much more interesting when you're doing five or six or seven different visa types than we're just, just doing one. David. Yeah, so I had, a meeting with someone on Tuesday and they, they came in and they said very specifically, what I want is a 143 concrete parent. That's the words that came out of their mouth. That's not what they meant. Yeah. I want permanent residence. 
is what they meant. They thought the 143 was the path to do it. So I agree with Sarah completely. It's often you, you listen to the client, but don't be limited by your client. Um, uh, my standard protocol is work out, ask them a specific question. Put aside this, put aside this visa palaver. What do you want? What's the objective you want? Because if you're here, and that's your objective, anything which moves you from there towards your objective is a good decision, potentially. Anything which moves you out there is a bad decision. So, um, and that's, I agree with Sarah completely about the breadth, and Helen made the same point. Um, what do I do? One of the best things, I, one of the best business decisions I ever made was a promise I made to myself in 1998. And I used to work in a chambers practice, a bunch of little lawyers all in the same floor. And I watched every male solicitor in their 50s, every one of them, have a heart attack, a stroke, an aneurysm, or their third divorce. There's, getting married for the fourth time is a triumph of optimism over experience, can I say. Um, and they were all sole practitioners. And I promised myself I'll never be a sole practitioner. That's the best decision I've ever made. So when I set up my firm, almost nine years ago now, the very first decision I made was, what business partner am I going to have? Um, and that's Joanne Kinsler, who's the Kinsler part of Kinsler Prince. I come up with a legal argument. Joe's task is to destroy it. Because if it survives Joe, it's probably a good idea, and vice versa. Having someone you can just turn to and talk to, and it's literally just the next office next to me, is gold. Or sometimes, you know, the client. And you pick up the phone and you hear their voice, and your stomach just drops, you know? Or if you've got some support staff and you hear, oh, it's Mr. X, and you just want to crawl under the desk and hide. You know, you know the clients we're talking about. We have a rule in my office. Um, when Jo has one of those, she gets to hand the client to me and I can't say no. Because that feeling, that pit in the stomach I want to crawl, is a, that's a negligence case waiting to happen because you've got a block. You can't deal with that client. You have to either give it to someone else or like, get it out of the firm. And so having that freedom to say, no questions asked, you have to take it. And I can, then I can go and run away and hide. Um, that is a huge benefit. If you're a sole practitioner, um, it's a big thing to say to the client, I want to sack you as a client, I can't look after you. As opposed to, look, I'm just really busy and, and your client's, your case is so important, it deserves top priority. I can't do that, but Joanne can. Um, that's an easy sales pitch. Um, and so that was, from a business perspective, um, I think being a sole practitioner, especially when you're a fairly inexperienced agent, it's rarely a good idea as a starting premise. But if you find yourself in that category, um, you must do an enormous amount of work to get networking. And when Helen and I were, were teaching together, the sub we often used to teach, um, I used to often did the third of the four subjects, which was the cancellations. Give me a good, I mean, what's my area? People say, what do I specialise in? I say disasters, because <laughs> that covers the field. Um, and Helen would often do the fourth subject, which is kind of the setting up the practice. And how, and, um, but when I teach cancellations, and once that person had recovered from their see me comatose, I just can't handle cancellations. I say, how do you say in con how do you up to date with the law? My standard protocol, and I, Helen used to raise this too, was join the MIA for their communication strategy. The Law Council has nothing on the MIA at all. That's playing on top of stuff. I mean, how often do I get, you know, the first I know about a, a, a legislative amendment is the MIA email. Now, you've got to read the blessed stuff. I'll come to that in a second, but there's no organisation superior in this country to keep you up to date with changes that what happens in the MIA. So when I, whenever I teach lawyers, I say to them, join MIA. For that, if, if for no other reason, for your communication strategy. So I can't the law council do it? I said, no, I've got enough time. The MIA has paid staff. The law council is lawyers doing stuff in our free time. So um, being part of a professional body is critical, at least the MIA. And if you're a lawyer, you should be at the law council as well in your, in your law societies. Um, but that's part of the networking strategy and that comes into, well, <laughs> upskilling and that's what Helen started with. Um, you should be doing CPD, which challenges you. If you know all about GSM, for goodness sake, go to a CPD which doesn't talk about GSM. And if you're choosing your CPD on the basis I get all my 10 points, on a Saturday for 300 bucks, you are wasting your time. 
that's meeting a regulatory need and is doing nothing at all, not one iota, to help you in your practice. All right, go to CPD, which challenges you. When you walk, if you don't walk out of a CPD saying, wow, I didn't know that. If you don't walk out of a CPD saying, whoa, I've just learned something I can make money out of, you're going to the wrong CPD. The whole point is, is to upskill you. And the more siloed you are in your work practice, the more critical what I'm saying is. Pay, if I said to you, give me $500 and I'll give you $2,000 this afternoon, you'd be running out to the ATM and give me money, wouldn't you? That's what good CPD does. You know, when's the last time you opened a file and you only charge a $300 to do work? If you are, come and talk to me because you're running the wrong type of practice. <laughs> I wouldn't open a file for that at all, let alone do the work. Um, and so you invest money to make money, and you make money by increasing your knowledge or the skills. So, um, and if you want to learn something, if you want to really understand something, volunteer to teach it. Sit down with a colleague in your group, and that's what I'm saying is WhatsApp groups, and, and have a, I know, um, just been through the specialist accreditation process round for lawyers, and the first thing I said to them is um, the candidates, get a study group up and running. And choose a study partner, study buddies, who do areas of migration law that you don't. So you can help each other. And they set little targets, I'm gonna, we're gonna do students next, oh, I've never done students, right, well I'm gonna teach you. There's nothing better than having to prep for a class that you're gonna teach to get you on top of the subject matter, because none of us like looking like an idiot. So, um, that's our basic starting premises as far as my firm is. Very good. Yes, sir. And I think, Jonathan, just one added thing, and it, it runs off from David's point, and it actually, I picked it up from years ago from Google. Google actually gives its staff like an afternoon a week, which is your go and work, not in the business, but on the business. Go and upskill yourself, read articles, do things. And I think it's really important to have that time that you set aside just to do the reading, just to read the paper and make sure you know, that you're on top of the political situation. But you've got to actually create time to do that because it's very, very easy for it all being in the business to take over the cases. Okay. Question up here. Hi, my name's Ashish. Um, I know exactly what you guys are talking about because um, I was working in a law practice about eight years and then last year I started on my own. Um, it's not very difficult. Um, I've joined the MIA forum. Um, I would really encourage people to do that. They've got some really helpful people up there. Um, any time of the day, at night, I've, I've asked questions at 11 o'clock at night, and I've had got people replying to me at 11.30 at night. That's um, on a Saturday John night. Fusion, probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on yeah, a be very careful about those answers. They don't sleep, they just are on the forum all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's got a Facebook page. Everyone's on Facebook, I think. Go on there, ask questions. Um, you'll get a lot of people answering. Um, there are some very good newsletters I just said, Mia, uh, Peter Bullard's newsletter. There are a couple of others. Um, you'll get them. Read up on it. It'll give you, you know, an idea of what's happening, what changes are coming. Um, and the network is a good idea. I've networked with a few other lawyers. Um, you know, I have a good understanding, let's say, of ESS. They have a good understanding of GSM. If you have questions, you can speak to each other. Um, the other thing was, um, there were a couple of comments made about um, free um, consultations. Um, look, I do a lot of free consultations. In fact, um, I've never charged anyone in the last one year for a consultation. Um, I look at it as partly pro bono, because um, I get a lot of students. Um, and I look at it partly as um, a marketing expense. consultation fee. I haven't got that, but I've had them come back to me when they're ready for a visa. I've had them refer their friends to me. Um, they've appreciated the fact that I've spent 15 minutes or an hour sitting with them, taking, it, taking them through the different possibilities and options, and that's generated work for me. So don't write it off as if you never do a free contract. Think of it as maybe as, as a marketing exercise, and um, it would generate work. I have to say, look, I, this is a, there's a place for, sometimes I might do a consult I don't charge for. It's unusual. 
um, as a general statement, my experience has been people who you do work for free send you other people who expect work for free. Um, as a lawyer, there's the three disaster cases, family, friends and free. Um, if you make a marketing decision to give your time away, then price it. There's no point giving a client a discount unless you've told them I've given you a discount. <laughs> so if you've got done $3,000 of work and you decide to give a $1,500 discount, you raise an invoice which says $3,000, but for you, I will accept $1,500. Right? Otherwise, there's a disconnect for what you're doing in your head and what they see but in their then they're head. also going to ask for a discount after you've charged the 1500 <laughs> Yes, so <laughs> um, if I give a discount, it's only even the last invoice, not the first for that precise reason. Mm. Um, but um, a lot of agents do consults for free um, and they lose, the, they're not valuing your time. Well, th that's different. I'm saying that there's time and places for marketing, yeah. but um, you've got you a legal liability on the advice you've given yes. in that. It's the same, same liability. One hour. Same liability. That's where you, you want to risk so manage your business practice around that. Is yeah. the thing. A 15 minute consult is a disaster as far yeah. as potential liability. Um, but if I say to someone, I'm going to charge you $550 and I don't want to pay it, I'm thinking, great, excellent. I've learned. I've just got rid of a time waster. Yep. Um, because if they're not willing to pay $550 for a consult, they won't pay five, six, seven grand for the visa. Um, and there's, there's another one there, if you're, if you're really not busy, you're desperate for work, you've got more flexibility for doing that type of stuff. But if you've got a fairly busy practice, you've just given away an hour of your time. Um, and so I would love to be of such independent wealth that I didn't need to charge. I'd love to run a pro bono practice, that'd be brilliant. Mm, mm. But my family have this bizarre attitude of wanting to be housed and fed, really fundamentally unreasonable. Your children also like to eat. It's incredibly yeah, unreasonable. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I'm not a big fan of free consults if that's your general practice. I, I, fundamentally, I just don't think you're respecting yourself and respecting your investment of time and effort to stay on top of the law. But I take your point too. In the student market, it's where that's a particular sector where it's expected from the students. And also the which is fundamentally different to the legal practices, the student market, if you're operating as an RMA, but also an education agent, is that yeah. the, the, the realisation of income is from the commission, not charging mm -hmm. the student either. So that's the business model, which generates that expectation that the upfront, in, uh, and really the, that consultation is, you know, part migration advice, but a lot of it's also student counselling, education pathway advice, which is not immigration advice. Um, and that, that, that's where the marketing money is. If it's pure migration work that you're, and you're advising on visas and, and not the student stuff, that's where that free consultation becomes a lot more dangerous because you're going into much more complex advice too around that and that's really where uh, different business models. Um, where's the next? You've got one there and then down. Okay. I'll get Svetlana, she's had a up of that. Well, first two, cons uh, two comments what this gentleman said, free consultations out of 10 clients that call my office and the moment I say, uh, do I want a couple of questions and I say, that's all right, but you need to make an appointment for a paid consultation, I can guarantee you nine out of 10 are happy to pay for the consultation and they will value your opinion more and they will refer more clients to you. Second comment is something I learned from my husband, who is a real estate agent. There's no such thing as a discount. Never use the word discount, because discount only creates an undervaluing of your skills in the mind of your client. So that, these are just two comments. That so I what should you call it then? Um, <laughs> Special. No, you don't do it. You don't do it. Don't use the word there are discount. certain cultures that expect it. It's, a, it's part of the haggle. So well, um, then you it's part of the marketing too. You know, it's well, so you, you say increase your fees by 20% so you can give you a 20% discount. <laughs> you basically say, I have a set fee. If I discount my fee, would you like me to discount my service to you? Let's we have a referral uh, <laughs> discount program. So if, you, if they if they're brought because they're, and their friend said to come or whatever. No, it's a referral incentive. That's right. <laughs> okay. 
don't use the word discount. Marketing one-on-one. You're asking, what's the language around it? Yeah, <laughs> so use the right language. Anyway, yeah. the comment I was going to make, and it was based on what David said, is uh, up until three months ago, I had staff, um, and now I'm back to being a sole practitioner. And I agree with you, nothing was better than having somebody sitting in the next office that you could um, vent, <laughs> consult, and also palm off a case. It's like, I have a problem with this person, like a personal problem. Uh, mm. That person gives me the heebie-jeebies. You take that one. No, you laugh, but we all have had cases like that. We all have clients like that. that. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes so being paid a lot of money just doesn't overcome, it doesn't compensate <laughs> it doesn't for the human suffering involved in dealing yeah. with that person. Unfortunately, now I'm back to being a sole practitioner. And I live in an extremely remote area. I live in Alice Springs. So it's, yes, I'm only a phone call away, but I really would like the MIA, MIA to, yes, we have the forum, and everybody knows I'm very active on that forum. Um, and we also have a Queen's at Lord and Tertiary Facebook group. It's just something where, where the MIA can set up something else as, as a networking tool for all those sole practitioners where we can vent and get that additional information rather uh, on a voluntary basis, but something more constructive because it seems that the forum is not really set up for that. Roman? some sort of, um, some, some groups for people like remote um, people and things like that. Now, we with better technology, we might get there. Yeah. Ron. And then, yeah. Roman, can, a question for Setlar and next person. Uh, uh, yes, Ron. Uh, Jonathan Tree, if I may. Uh, David, a question. Uh, July 2019, some solicitors' practices are deciding to take up the immigration field. What is the likelihood of those practitioners joining the MIA? I'd say not a jot difference to why a lawyer would join the MIA today, or not a jot difference to why a lawyer would have joined the MIA five years ago. I just think it's unchanged. I mean, Peter and I have been a member of the MIA for a long time yep. because we choose to do so, because there's value to us in doing so, and we think we can add value to the MIA. So I just don't think it'll change. I'm not going to stop being an MIA, and any lawyer I'm talking to when I train them, my firm does two specialist CPD a year normally, and I routinely will say, join the MIA. And the fact that none of them are the agents anymore won't change that at all. And one of the reasons you say that is, as you said before, the information that we're providing is more robust and on timely than what the Law Council can produce. Well, the Law Council is not trying yeah. to replicate yeah. that. They just, it's, they don't have the Secretary of Staff to do that. They just don't not try to say it, which is why I say to my colleague, join the MIA. Mm. I mean, it's simple. For the annual membership, was at 500 bucks. One, one email from um, talking about legislative change which starts a week ago, but this is the, let me tell you, the very best marketing tool ever. The law is going to change next Friday, client. Mm. If you retain me between now and Friday to run your case, you'll get permanent residence. After Friday, you don't. Now, if this hand in my trust account holds $7,000, this hand will lodge your application. <laughs> it's a rare client who says no. And for $500, you just, it's, that's simple. In fact, you know that change is coming. You have to read the emails, though. It's simple. Good. Is there another question, Ron, or that was it? That's it, good, thanks. Um, good afternoon, Svetlana Gunaratne with Visa Solutions. Um, I have a question. There have been a lot of debates about unregistered practices, and that's what worries me more rather than lawyers' uh, competition between agents and lawyers. Uh, unregistered uh, education agents, and I do deal with a lot of student, with student visas, um, they unfortunately do that um, uh, unprofessional job, and student visas being refused. Some people coming to me to run their cases with the IIT, and um, they're very sophisticated and very difficult to catch those people because they lodge an application and it appears that's been lodged by a client themselves. Mm -hmm. So th that is very disappointing. Mm -hmm. Few people, uh, the application was lodged out of time, it wasn't, wasn't even lodged, so 
they became mm. unlawful, they came to me. So it was very mm. uh, disappointing, very disappointing. So is there anything that the department or uh, MIA or OMAR is going to do with this uh, issue? I think this has been an issue for a really, really long time, unfortunately. And I think the MIA is constantly, you know, M Mara will just say it's with outside our jurisdiction. They only look after registered agents. It's really immigration department that needs to pursue those people. But read our it, submission, the joint parliamentary inquiry into <coughs> the profession. Uh, the MIA went to great lengths in that, on that particular subject, in particular onshore education agents. To the, uh, they presented evidence to the committee um, and then was, so there's, go to the MIA website to actually have a look at that, um, our submission which is published there, but the, um, you know, we've been hammering that same argument for a long time. It's frustrating because I've been, I had a uh, very robust discussion with a uh, previous assistant minister on the definition of immigration assistance and versus clerical assistance. And I found it very frustrating that he was not on board with what is clearly the, the legal definition, uh, providing any advice around genuine temporary entry and any reference or having to refer to Ministerial Direction 69 is not clerical assistance. Just understanding Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 of an onshore visa. It's different in the offshore because it's less, the risk of a refusal offshore is just relodge another visa. The risk onshore is all the other consequences of the current visa status. And that's where we've always had that same view. The, the lower hanging fruit for the, the government is to uh, accept that the Australian regulations do not permit that and it's a criminal act. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, but it's just, that, that's the MIA's position. The Law Council's position has been very consistent with the same thing. The Australian laws are quite clear, but then in practice, and um, I think Leslie and I, we talked about this when you were student visa director, long time, you know, it, it, it's not a new con topic. Um, it's been good that it's actually had the opportunity of a joint parliamentary committee to actually really start, and politicians asking the questions a bit more. Uh, where that goes, not, not sure. just is the Commonwealth not doing anything about it, they're facilitating criminal mm. conduct. Yeah. And what does the Commonwealth do? Gave the MIMI account to do that. So not just as the Commonwealth not stopping it, they facilitated the whole damn industry <laughs> to do that. So uh, it's, let's face it, nothing the Law Council can do, nothing the MIA can do about it. It's all about the Commonwealth. And for a start, they could stop dealing with agents outside the bloody country at our embassies with anything to do, or the VHS, et cetera, when they know that this damn email is a, is a dodgy third party. Mm. They know this stuff, they just don't action it. Sorry, Mark. Sorry. No, no, wait, wait, wait. It's whoever's got the mic, I'll come back <laughs> to you. There's been some rumours that the government wants to remove merits review. Uh, governments tend to like to, 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 do, to control things and uh, they're not happy with some of the decisions coming out of the AAT. So some people um, have some opinions that the executive wants to uh, remove or make it very difficult for particularly in immigration, to achieve merits review through the AAT. Um, and I believe George Brandis had uh, some personal conflict with uh, Peter Dutton and, and, uh, and some other members in the executive about that. Are you aware of anything in that respect and what do you think is the likelihood? Does it have any legs? Are you worried about it at all? Well, I could. There's no, con before. There's, there's no constitutional right to merits review. The government could remove all merits review with a flick of a pen. Before about 1974, merits review didn't exist in Australia at all. We created the AAT. So they could. It'd be great. My judicial review practice would go through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, um, we'd win far more cases. Mm. A big reason for not winning in the courts is because the, they had merits review who gave you a good go. Um, and so we have a massive success rate and at the courts when you have decisions that don't have merits review. The For instance, an 8503 waiver knockback, I have never, ever once lost in the federal courts on 8503 case. Invalidity, the application is invalid. So could they, of course. Um, do I think it's likely? No. What I think is more likely is 
the Immigration Assessment Authority, the IAA, this is the subset of the old Refugee Review Tribunal, just in with their legacy caseload. Un unauthorised maritime arrivals, we, before we started shipping them off to Manus and Nauru where we torture children, that's just an objective fact. Um, before that, there was about 30,000 people who we collected who arrived before that date, magic date in 2013. And it was only last year that in general we lifted the barrier, let them wash through. So we've created this subset of merits review, we call it merits review light, is the kindest analysis. Mm -hmm. Some call it the fig leaf. Um, and it's dramat dramatically limited. There's no oral hearings, there's very limited circumstances where there's um, new evidence. Um, it's more likely that that's a try out, see what we can get away with. Um, and it's been less than what they'd hoped. And I think it's more likely that that model could roll out um, into the Migration and Refugee Division, um, such as um, oral hearings are unusual, um, that new evidence could only be given in special circumstances, when the effectively merits review is a bit like the old Miro, the Migration Internal Review Office, and I'm showing my age, which is when you ask the department to have a look at it again. Um, and there was a 4% success rate on that review, which the government thought was magnificent, actually. Um, bizarrely, the department rarely decided that the department was wrong. Um, so I think it's more likely that, um, that that limited merits review in the IAA model could be expanded to other areas of the AAT. Um, that's more likely than merits review being removed. I think that would be quite politically dangerous mm -hmm. for the government and not one I think that they mm -hmm. jump at a hurry. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my gut though. Thank you. Well, unfortunately we have run out of time, Peter. Um, the most important thing is networking, uh, finding any different way to always be able to tap into other agents if you're trying to work out what do I do with this file or the changes and things like that. Continue that when you're in your coffee sessions. Continue that when you go home to each stage. Make sure you've made those connections. I'd like to thank our panel, David Prince, Sarah Hatch and Helen Duncan.